Hello and welcome back everyone. An inflammation is a sort of a reaction by the body to either an infection, an injury or any kind of stress. Inflammation can be regarded as a defense mechanism which in most cases helps our body to overcome an infection and eradicate the invading organism. But in some cases, inflammation can also be harmful for us, as in the case of an autoimmune disease in which the body starts an inflammatory reaction against itself and start to cause a reaction against certain types of cells. An example of such autoimmune disease is a type 1 diabetes. But nonetheless, in most individuals, inflammation helps to heal and defend against foreign particles. So during inflammation, blood flow to the injured or the infected part is increased many folds. This causes redness and warmth in the affected area and hence results in swelling of the organ. The increased blood flow causes the white blood cells to gather in the affected part and provide a defense against the invading organism. And because of these vascular changes, an inflammatory response can also produce pain and discomfort. So there are two main types of inflammation. One is the acute inflammation which is basically a short standing inflammatory response and the other is the chronic inflammation which is more of a long standing inflammatory response. Now there is a wide array of chemical mediators that are released during an inflammatory reaction and naturally there are other major differences between the two types of inflammation. But our topic is about pulpal inflammation so let's keep it simple. So this was a very concise description of inflammation. Now any organ that is undergoing inflammation is most of the time given a name ending with an ITIS or itis like the inflammation of pancreas is known as pancreatitis, inflammation of meninges of the brain is known as meningitis and similarly the inflammation of gingiva is known as gingivitis and the inflammation of the pulp of a tooth is known as pulpitis. Now why does the pulp undergo inflammation? Now as I previously stated, there needs to be some kind of irritant or some kind of stimulus for the inflammation to happen. So there are two broad types of potential irritants for the dental pulp and its surrounding periradicular tissues. They are the living and the non-living irritants. Non-living can include chemical, thermal or mechanical causes. Mechanical irritants such as deep cavity preparation, tooth structure removal without cooling, trauma, all can lead to changes in the underlying pulp. As more pulp is removed during cavity preparation, more potential for damage is increased as the dentinal tubules become larger near the pulp. Similarly, operative procedures without water spray or coolant can cause irritation to the pulp and hence can elect an inflammatory response. Impact injuries without any tooth fracture can also result in pulpal damage. Whether a pulp can recover successfully from such injuries depends on a lot of factors such as apical closure, the type of injury and various others. Chemical irritants such as dentinal cleansing substances or certain materials placed during temporary or permanent restoration can cause potential irritation to the pulp and sometimes elect an inflammatory response. The second category of irritants to the pulp are the living irritants which includes microbial irritants like bacteria, fungi and also viruses. And among all of these irritants, microbial irritants are the most significant cause of pulpal inflammation because microorganisms such as those present in dental caries can cause some serious irritation to the pulp and cause pulpal necrosis, a topic which we have already discussed in detail in our previous lecture on endodontic microbiology. Now a normal healthy pulp doesn't get irritated that easily and can recover itself but over time due to repeated exposure to different stresses, the pulpal tissue may become compromised. The remaining dentinal thickness or the RDT is a very important factor for a healthy pulp because dentine prevents a direct contact between the pulp and the bacteria. If the remaining dentinal thickness is reduced less than 1.1 to 1.5 mm, then inflammatory cells in the pulp increase many times. And therefore slight injuries such as spits and fissure caries and shallow cavity preparations cause no inflammation in the pulp, while deep caries and extensive operative procedure result in a more severe pulpal inflammatory response and hence results in pulpitis. Once the pulp is irritated, various biological systems are activated which results in inflammatory mediators like histamine, bradykinin, arcadinoic acid, metabolites being released into the pulp. Pulpitis also results in increased vascular permeability and with that there is an increased migration of leukocytes to the site of injury. But unlike connective tissue in other parts of the body, normal pulp lack mast cells but these mast cells are often present in inflamed pulp, a distinction which you need to remember. Now there are many different steps of an inflammatory response that you have already studied in your pathology but for a dental student who is studying endodontics, those are less important. Now based on clinical signs and symptoms, there are two main types of pulpitis, the reversible pulpitis and the irreversible pulpitis. 
the reversible pulpitis is more of an acute condition while the irreversible pulpitis is more of a chronic condition and is often a sequel to the reversible pulpitis. The reason why they are named such is because the reversible pulpitis by definition can more likely be reversed if the cause is removed, meaning that a pulp with reversible pulpitis can revert back to its original state once the cause of inflammation, for example a carious lesion, is removed. While a pulp with irreversible pulpitis cannot revert back to its original state even if the cause is removed. So without a proper treatment, a pulp which is irreversibly inflamed will most likely eventually undergo necrosis even if the cause is removed. And hence that tooth undergoing irreversible pulpitis requires a different treatment. Therefore, understanding both types of pulpitis is very important for the dentist in order to properly treat them because they both require separate and different treatments. I will discuss each of them in detail in my next lecture where we will discuss more about their clinical features and diagnosis and also their treatment. Until next time, take care of yourselves and your loved ones, stay safe and goodbye.